foreheads. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us here this morning to celebrate this way. Thank you for giving us into song and hymns and just being able to sing unto you, Lord. What a blessing that is. Thank you for beginning this day's service that way. We're just so grateful for all the truth that sets us free, Father, the truth we find in the written word, your word. It is your scripture and it is your salvific plan after all. And we're just so grateful to partake in the knowledge of it, to be filled with wisdom as a result of it. Thank you. We do pray for those in the congregation that can't be here for one reason or another. We want them to know that we're with them in spirit. And we just pray that you bring them back to the fold in your good timing, of course. We pray also for those still in this world without hope, without saving faith, that they repent and believe before it's too late that we have additional brothers and sisters in Christ for all of eternity. We are most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work on the cross to cancel out that debt and to make mornings like this one just times to rejoice and sit back, relax, and be washed over by your word. On that note, we just ask for your blessings on this morning's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. How's that AC? Is it all right back there? Not too loud or anything? It's okay. Okay. Part 23, the order of salvation. Again, pace yourself. It is a relatively long message, and we have communion service as well. Um, always, always, are you listening? Always remember this up here on the board. Don't ever let it depart from your soul. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Didn't we just sing that? Hmm. Imagine that. Let's see what our good friend Job had to say about this wisdom that the psalmist also captured in Holy Scripture. And we want to read the entire context of the passage to get a full picture of Job's sentiments. Go to Job 28.1. This is dead in the middle of this book of suffering and Job's battle with towing the line without any real help from his friends or his spouse. I mean, his Children are dead. He's lost everything for the most part. Um, save his life. He's stricken with boils and the whole nine yards. You know, next time you think you have it bad, just think of Job. And then also remember that he really didn't, specifically speaking, deserve any of it. Like God just said, I'm going to cut Satan the one and only Satan, I'm going to cut him loose on this guy. Who, who here can say they have that? All right, so Job 28.1. So this is in the middle of all that. Surely, now get your perspective because this is what Job's going to do here. He kind of says, okay, I'm going to show you. I'm going to give a little credence, if you would, to man first. Then we're going to transition. So this is, the why, this is why we're reading for context, okay? Surely there is a mine for silver and a place for gold that they refine. Iron is taken out of the earth and copper is smelted from the ore. Man puts an end to darkness and searches out to the farthest limit, the ore and gloom and deep darkness. He opens shafts in a valley away from where anyone lives. They are forgotten by travelers. They hang in the air far away from mankind. They swing to and fro. As for the earth, out of it comes bread. But underneath it is turned up as by fire. Its stones are the place of sapphires, and it has dust of gold. That path no bird of prey knows, and the falcon's eye has not seen it. The proud beasts 
have not trodden it. The lion has not passed over it. Man puts his hand to the flinty rock and overturns mountains by the roots. He cuts out channels in the rocks, and his eye sees every precious thing. He dams up the streams so that they do not trickle, and the thing that is hidden he brings out to light. Now, we might say at this point that Job is giving so-called credit where credit is due. In other words, man has done a lot in his endeavor, in his in industriousness to discover all kinds of things. Digs up the ground, learns about lava, learns about gold, learns about diamonds, you know, climbs mountains, turns over mountains, tunnels through mountains, flies in the air, sends people to, you know, the moon and back. We've done an awful lot of stuff. Is that fair? I mean, it's earthly. But nonetheless, we've done an awful lot of stuff as, as mankind. Okay, again, so we might say that Job is giving credit where credit is due in the sense that man really has accomplished a lot of earthly things. But, and here comes the perspective that matters, especially this morning, verse 12. But where shall wisdom be found? Uh-oh. So you've turned over every stone, you've looked every which way, you've done this, that, and the other, you've discovered, I mean, think of science, the advancements in science, and yet there's a bunch of educated idiots out there with PhDs or triple PhDs talking about black holes and evolution and Darwinism and yada, yada, yada. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Look at verse 13. This really sets us back, doesn't it? Man does not know its worth. Man does not know its worth. And it is not found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me. And the sea says, it is not with me. It cannot be bought for gold. And silver cannot weigh as, weigh as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of offer in precious onyx or sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. From where, then, does, this, does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding? So Job repeats verse 12. Where then does wisdom come? We've looked everywhere. Where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and death say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. Even the thing that people seem to fear the most, death cannot locate it. But... But look at verse 23. God understands the way to it, and he knows its place. You see what Job just did there? He just crushed any endeavor that man might embark on to locate it on his own. God understands the way to it. Man doesn't. Man doesn't even value it properly. Puts value in earthly things, gold, silver, pearls, precious stones. Says, well, if I achieve all this, if I make a lot of money, if I build a lot of wealth, if I have a lot of stuff, if I have all the right relationships, if I do this, that, and the other, then I've, quote, made it. Then I must have wisdom. But you don't. Not unless God has guided you there. Not unless you have the proper perspective of all the above. God understands the way to it, and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. Verse 25, when he gave to the wind its weight and apportioned the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder, then he saw it and declared it. He established it and searched it out. This is, in other words, his business. Verse 28, and then he said, to man, and Job quotes the Lord here, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. 
and to turn away from evil is understanding. You see what he just did? I hope you see the discourse there. And then he said to man, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Do you need to own even one ounce of gold? No. Do you have to at least run one marathon in your life or climb Mount Everest or have the, quote, sought-after job or the you fill in the blanks to have wisdom? Not at all. If you want wisdom, you just fear the Lord. That means you can be completely destitute from world standards. The whole world could look at you as a pauper and say, you're a nobody, you're a worthless nothing. But if you have fear of the Lord, you have much, something much greater than anybody that does or says those things to you. You have fear of the Lord. That is wisdom. So says the Lord. Turn away from evil. That is understanding. Does that sound vaguely familiar? Look it up on the board again. Psalm 111.10. What, what did the psalmist say? The same thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I guess it's not novel. This is a theme throughout the entire Bible. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You can have a lot of knowledge. I know people that could quote scripture, but I am absolutely convinced they are not saved even. Satan could easily come up here right now and regurgitate this entire Bible in any language you'd want, including the original. Doesn't mean he believes in it. Doesn't mean he abides by it. Doesn't mean he obeys it. Just means he's really smart. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have good understanding. His praise endures forever. And just to give a bigger perspective, right? Some of you already know this, but maybe you don't. Job, the book of Job, was the first book penned in the Bible, as far as most theologians will say. I have no reason to think otherwise. In other words, it's the oldest one, the oldest manuscript, the oldest original writing. Even though it doesn't show up first in order, it is grouped with the wisdom books like Psalms and Proverbs, etc. But the point is, it just goes to show that the word of God endures forever. Right? Job didn't have to wait to read the psalmist to say, oh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He already knew it. And so it's captured in the book after his name. But the bigger picture here is that it's not novel at all. That wisdom has preexisted mankind altogether. So the correct way to think about his word is eternal, meaning not only everlasting, meaning, you know, from this point on, it's going to just keep going. That's true. But rather that it's eternal, which includes what we would call eternity past. So it's the, if you look at the, at the whole timeline of things, if you think from God's perspective, who outside the construct of time, it just is. This Wisdom just is. The word, as we say, is immutable. This wisdom is immutable, meaning it never changes. And we learned a lot about the immutability, the unchangeability of God's word recently when we studied out God's sovereign decree that it existed before human history even began. And that's a brain twister for a lot of people. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What does the Bible say? The Bible says that's true, therefore we accept it on what? Faith. The capstone statement so far this morning up here on the board, the immutable word of God, think of this way, two scriptures actually three, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So he's eternal. Jesus Christ is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Fast forward, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's John 1, 1 and 1, 14. Applying this practically to our everyday lives, as we noted last time up here on the board then, to fear the Lord is tantamount to fearing His Word. The Lord has never changed, nor has His Word. He didn't have a different thought because, oh, well, so-and-so was just born, and you know what? They're such an original thinker, I never thought about that before. Let me go back, erase my decree, and adjust it based on what Uncle Jimmy had to say about the world. I never thought that way. Some people propose that. The truth of the matter is, whether we like it or not, whether it's suitable to our human sensibilities or not, is that it's immutable. The decree has always existed in the mind of God. There's nothing you and I have ever said to change his mind about any of it. So that's the beginning, that's the fear of the Lord, saying, okay. The fear of the Lord, then, is tantamount, same thing as fearing his word. Because God doesn't lie. So whatever comes out of his mouth, whatever ends up in the Bible, which he authored, which he divinely inspired, well, we have to have fear for that as well. It's just an expression of who he is, who he's always been, immutably. This is what the Lord was saying, Job 28, 28, he said to, that, to man, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to turn away from evil is understanding. So, you can measure your supposed fear of the Lord in one very practical, undeniable, biblical way. You can measure your supposed fear of the Lord in one very practical, undeniable, biblically supported way by measuring your obedience to His Word your obedience to his word. Because you can say, oh, I definitely fear the Lord. But you never obey him at his word. You never take his word and obey it. And so, since they're the same thing, what do you say? It sounds like lip service. Here's an analogy, a very quick one. If you fear and respect your parents... What do you do when they instruct you to do this or that? You obey them. Same goes with God the Father. If we fear and respect him truly, then we obey his word truly. It's implied. All right, with that said, let's get back to our, at least closer to our primary course of study on the order of salvation where we read Holy Scripture that says some things that we simply must accept and obey as truth. If indeed we have righteous fear and respect for God, that is. So that's your choice. You say, do I trust God? Do I respect Him? Do I fear Him? And when His Word comes to me, when I read it, when it's preached, do I accept it? Go to Romans 8.29. Romans 8.29. Do I accept it? Do I obey his commandments? You might know, even think about his word very broadly as one big commandment, right? It's his word. Romans 8.29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And the Spirit's been giving us so much encouragement on that one verse. If God is for us, who can be against us? 
So last time the Spirit had us pause on this verse, seeking to point out a different perspective for us as necessary. We may rightly say that he was doing us a really big favor in doing so, saying, take a moment and think about what's really going on here. What does that mean about your conception of his salvific plan even? If God is for us, who can be against us? In other words, how much of that plan depends on you? How much does God rewrite regarding his decree, say for election and predestination, after you were born? If you're humble, you will receive this kind of guidance with gratitude. The evidence of said humility will be whether or not you accept the following as truth up here on the board. You are not the hand. You are the instrument God uses to his glory. That's it. That's it. Remember, Paul, I am what I am by the grace of God. I, sh I worked really hard, harder than the rest, but it was the grace of God in me. So he knew. He also wrote Romans 6, right? Be an instrument of righteousness. He knew what it meant to be a vessel of mercy, an instrument of righteousness, someone that God can use, not a robot. And that's the mystery. Raise your hand if you did not choose to come here this morning. So you still make decisions, right? You still have your own will. That's the mystery. But you cannot, you cannot, you should not try to usurp God's sovereignty in said exercise of that will. The Bible doesn't say that we have done all this magnificent supernatural work in ourselves. It says, he, he, he. That's why we read that golden chain, if you would. So when Paul says in verse 31, what shall we say to these things? God, If God is for us, who can be against us? When Paul wrote this, he was saying, now that you've heard who is responsible for your salvation, you have the ability to rest comfortably peacefully in said salvation. I'll say it again. Now that you've heard who is responsible wholly for your salvation, you have the ability to rest peacefully, contentedly in that salvation. I mean, I said this last time, we can't honestly say that we are even for us. It says if God is for us. It, we can't even say that we are for us. You might, for a season, argue that you are. You might say, oh, no, I am. I, I totally am. You should see how I'm living. I've turned my life around. Maybe for a season you could argue such a thing. But if you really were for yourself, you wouldn't have a trail of carnage behind you that you, indeed, have caused in your own life and the lives of others. I mean, who the heck wants to hurt themselves? But every time we sin, and we sin daily, we hurt ourselves. So how can you possibly say that you're even for you? You're not even for yourselves and you're saved. How are you when you're completely destitute? You, there's no way on earth you're for yourself. Your very nature precludes you from being so. An honest person will always concede that they are often their worst enemy. I don't want my worst enemy deciding my destination, my destiny. Because he or she will do it on a whim. You know a fickle man is. Women. Women. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You guys like... <laughs> So I don't know about you, but I personally thank God every day that my salvation, both positionally 
and experientially does not depend upon me. I'm really happy with that because if it depended on me, I'm doomed. And that's what he's been teaching us. If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, I'm not for me. You're not for you. But God is. If you're one of his children, he is. Thank God. So I thank God daily because if it was up to me, oh man, I'm doomed. And so if we extend this truth to our topic here, this 43-part topic regarding salvation, we might say if God has chosen you, then no one or nothing can alter his purpose and will for you. And that's that. And that's a really good feeling to have even, not to be all wishy-washy. But that's a really good truth to understand, to rest in. If God has indeed chosen you, then no one or nothing can alter his purpose and his will for you. What about like Philippians 1.6, right? I'm sure of this very thing, that he will complete a good thing he started in you. I'm confident of it. Why? Because God has a love for his children that's very special. And his will is never thwarted. Remember that? Like Isaiah 55, 8 through 11? It never comes back empty-handed. You may not understand it because my ways are not your ways, but that's not the point. The point is, you little one are never going to thwart my will. And you definitely are not going to rewrite my decree. Something that existed before you were even born. I don't know. That's not, the only part of me that is offended by that is my flesh. Because then my flesh has to go, well, then I have no control. But the new creature is like, I don't know why you chose me. Who am I? To quote that song. But you did. Paul wrote encouragingly over and over about this very topic. So let's continue. Look at Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, no powers, no height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so here's our takeaway up here on the board. We've read that passage quite a few times now. God's stronghold on his elect. From God's perspective, what does that look like? Just knowing that God has chosen you and nothing could possibly ever tear you away from him ought to be the most encouraging truth of all regarding salvation. Some of you are like, hey, that sounds like the doctrine of eternal security. Okay. Sounds about right. If he saves you, he's not letting you go. Let's put it that way. Just knowing that. You should be like, well, thank God, because the alternative is it depends on me. And even 1% depending on me, I'm going to pollute it. So thank God it's 100% him. Amen? That's the point. That's all he's been saying for this entire series. Literally, the entire series is to establish this one point. So this brings us to this final piece of ordo salutis. Right, the Latin for the order of salvation. 
And for some awful reason, this topic drives people bananas. Regeneration. I don't, I mean, I understand why it drives people bananas, but it shouldn't. It's in the Bible. And if it's in the Bible, then we say, okay. I don't always understand every last aspect of it or why God regenerated this one and not that one necessarily, but that's not my business. So this regeneration thing drives some people bonkers. But I'll say this, and I think I say this later on in the message too. Um, you don't need to understand. Okay, we're going, here, here's the gospel, what you might present to an unbeliever. And they can willfully believe in that in said gospel and be saved. Right? This is you and I. We are members of God's family. Presuming I'm speaking charitably that everybody in here is actually saved. Right? Um, we're just turning around and saying, oh my word, you did all of that? I didn't even know the half of it. And so it's us as members of God's family having the privilege and the time to reflect on everything that he's done for us. Does that make sense? And that's the beauty of what he's been doing here. He's saying, oh yeah, when you were born, you didn't, I mean, when you were saved, you didn't realize necessarily that you were regenerated. That word regenerated probably never even came up in the conversation. It's not even part of the gospel presentation necessarily. Doesn't have to be. Is it the truth of the matter? Yeah. Is it absolute truth? Yeah. So we have the privilege as believers to look back and investigate and learn more and more how much he's done for us. We would call that grace. By faith we accept it and our love just blooms because we say, oh my word, you did all that for me? I never knew. It's like one of those movies you watch, right? Where there's a silent benefactor behind the scenes making sure that some young child is taken care of for the rest of their life and they don't know that that person even exists. And then at the end they say, I didn't even know you exist. Didn't matter. I loved you. I just wanted to even from afar watch it. Not that God's from afar, but you get the point. I just wanted you to be safe and secure. Right? They didn't understand it all. You didn't understand it all. Yeah, I'm, I'd be willing to bet no one in here really understood predestination when they were saved or election. People would be like, huh? What is that? Well, until you have the ability to understand spiritually appraised things according to the Bible, you're never going to understand it. You'll probably reject it. So this idea, this, this doctrine, this regeneration, it drives people bonkers. Um, Jesus referred to it in his dialogue with Nicodemus as being born again. In theology, these are essentially the same concept, just two different ways to describe God's supernatural work in an unbeliever. Here's a principle from a previous past, a message up here on the board. Being born again, according to Jesus, okay, so this is a good start for us. Being born again is a supernatural act of God, the Holy Spirit, as part of God's salvific plan. No one will ever see or enter the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Because you are born spiritually dead and spiritually blind and spiritually deaf. So something supernatural has to happen. Amen? That's the whole point. Something has to happen. Something you can't do on your own. Now I need to take pause here for a moment and I need you to concentrate. I need you all to think about all the doctrines the Spirit has given us over the past few years from this pulpit. So we're going back, big picture now. 
all the way back to, say, 2015 with the so-called gospel reload. Take yourself all the way back. I know you're like, man, are you serious, man? Right? It's like hundreds and hundreds of hours of taught. And, you know, because you guys are such amazing students, that means there's thousands of hours of studying. 2015, the gospel reload. Big picture. If you've been here that long, then you may remember that the Spirit began the good work of dismantling what we've colloquially or dubbed, if you want to call it that, dubbed the watered-down gospel. That sadly is so prevalent in our country. So he started this good work in us. And he said, especially if you're saved, I don't want you to misrepresent what I'm saying, what the actual gospel is. So reflecting on that, big picture, it seems, I found to oversimplify, so bear with me, it seems we are living in a world of polar ends when it comes to Christianity even. There's, there's, there are massive contentious divides in Christianity. I'm not talking about the church, capital C. I'm talking little c churches. You know, you don't, nobody gives you a test. The government doesn't give you a test when they give you 501c3 status to open up a building, right? They don't do that. They say, okay, you say you're a Christian, and go for it. Satan's like, yeah. There's this huge chasm between these polar ends in Christianity, and they both call themselves Christians. But their gospel, if you were to investigate them, they're extremely different. How can that be? There was only one Christ, Christians, right? There's only one Christ. So how can there be these massive polar ends regarding his gospel? I mean, he said, I didn't, I didn't even come here to judge. I came to seek and to save that which is lost. So he had a really good idea. And he was a, the best teacher in human history. And guess what? He didn't speak eloquently. He spoke very simply. He said, this is how simple it is. I am. It's about me. It's not about what you know even. It's, it's about me. Do you accept me? I'm the Savior. It's me. Listen to what I'm telling you. So it's a wonder how his word is literally captured in this book, available to everyone, but there's a polar end over there and there's a polar end over there. How does that happen? What do you think? Satan. And I'm, we're going to get to this. This is why it's a little longer of a message because this is fantastic. So anyways, it seems we live in a polar or a world of polar ends. And let's just keep it to Christendom for now, okay? So-called Christians are either the Judaistic slash Catholic sort, thinking they need to be good enough to earn their way into heaven. So there's that polar end. Well, I got to be good enough. I got to make the bar, so to speak. Well, God's not going to be happy with me. And maybe he's going to say, I don't want you. You're, you were never good enough. You were just below the line. Sorry, Chucky. So there's that school of thought. That's way over there. Salvation by works. Or, on the other end of the spectrum, rejecting the harsh Catholic God, because that one's a, you know, do as a do, do, you know. And replacing him with an emaciated, so-called Savior that is begging for people to invite him into their hearts. This Jesus that's not really Jesus, this thing. Neither is the gospel that we find in Holy Scripture. Neither one. So the Holy Spirit's been ferreting out quite surgically through this vessel. And trust you, me, it's hard. We've lost people along the way because of their stickiness to old things. It's hard work to surgically cut these things out 
any remnants, all you ex-Catholics or you ex-watered-down gospel believers might be clinging to. It's hard work because the lies are very intricate. And like a good counterfeit, what do you have to do if you have a, a counterfeit $100 bill? It takes a while to examine it, right? You have to kind of go like this. All right, let me see. Oh, there's, okay, is that the line? Is that the right line? Oh, was it you have to spend time almost surgically examining it. Be really nice just to take it and go spend it at Chili's or wherever you'd like to go, right? I mean, I tend to eat healthy, <laughs> greasy food at Chili's. I don't know about you. Probably eat that garbage stuff at some, you know, tofu place. I don't know. Just saying. Wouldn't it be nice just to grab it and go eat and enjoy it? No, well, even that gets perverted. So it takes time. The point is that takes time to discover what how something is a counterfeit because a counterfeit is specifically designed to look like the real thing. Okay? And what's the purpose of this surgery? Freedom. Up here on the board, Galatians 5.1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Jesus didn't go through all this to set you free so you could go right back into slavery. So if you are here this morning, chances are you are a believer. That is my hope. Again, I have to teach charitably, otherwise I'd be pausing every two seconds. So I teach as if my congregation, this church even this morning, is filled with believers. So chances are you're a believer. And as a side note, ironically, you didn't even need to understand most of what I've been teaching in this series in order to be saved, I mentioned that earlier. For who among us can say that we understood election and predestination when first saved? Again, if you are here this morning, chances are you are a believer, and you have God to thank for that. You have God to thank for that. As the spirits pointed out over and over in this subseries, the order of salvation. If it weren't for God's direct intervention, you'd be spiritually dead still. You'd be spiritually dead still if it wasn't for God. So you have to ask yourself, do you agree with that statement? That's the question. If you don't, as your shepherd, please call me directly and we can talk about it. Honestly, I'm always available. It's imperative that you've been set free. Now listen. It's imperative that you've been set free from the bondage of your ill-conceived, so-called, capital F, capital W, free will. It's imperative that you be set free from the bondage of that thing. Now, do you hear what I just said? Some of you are like, wait a minute. Free seems like freedom. Freedom. Not if you pervert it. Not if it's perverted. Let me repeat myself. It's imperative that you've been set free from the bondage of your ill-conceived, so-called, quote, free will. Anyone who supposes they can assert their own will over God's is in bondage to a lie. Up here on the board. So this is the perspective, and this is why you're concentrating. Any assertion that God's will is submissive to man's is evil. Any assertion. To function in evil is to abide in the sphere of unrighteousness, a.k.a., also known as, to be a slave of unrighteousness, a la Romans 6, to borrow from Paul. This places a person in bondage to their so-called, quote, free will, a will that supposes such a thing. Your will will never outwill God's. Is that fair? Do you believe that? You have to. Your will will never outwill the will of God. If God wants something to be a certain way, you ready? Drum roll. It's going to be that way. And anybody that has any true faith will say, Amen. I'm not saying you have to do it now. Everybody's like, oh, Amen! I, 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 I got 
right? I got it. No, that's, no, I'm saying inside of you. You have to say amen to that. God, you're sovereign. I fear you. I can't even hold a candlestick to you. I don't even know what's going on at the time. But I know you love me, because the more I read this, the more I realize it. The more blown away I am, the more submissive I am. So I can't even comprehend the ends of it, which, again, I'm appreciative for, because it makes me love you all the more. But I can't. Mm -mm. So I hope you see the importance of what I'm saying. I need you to concentrate some more. In order to gain wisdom here, you have to think the way Satan. Concentrate. In order to gain true wisdom, you have to think the way Satan, the great scheming deceiver, thinks. Now, listen to my voice. What's the best way to get a person to abide in this kind of evil that the Spirit's got on the table. What's the best way to get a person to abide in a false supposition regarding the will of man? It's simple. You ready? Convince them that it is light. Convince them that it is light. How, pray tell, does anyone get duped this way? Easy. Have the deliverer of the counterfeit light be disguised as an angel of light. There's the payload and there's the syringe. The syringe is the agency. It is usually some person, some false teacher who says, I'm going to take this payload, this false doctrine, and I'm just going to ever so, it's just going to feel a slight prick. Oh! And what they do, a lot of times they go, you think I'm pretty? You think I'm handsome? Right? Why do you think sexual sins are so prevalent in the Bible? Stay the hell away from them. Why? Because that needle is right there at the ready always. You're too distracted by all the emotions and, brrr, and you don't know what's going on. You just go, you ever see how a, a, a good doctor uh, gives a baby a shot? They give the parent a rattle or some toy or something like that, and they distract them. They distract them. And then the baby's like, ah, and then they shoot them in the leg. The baby's like, hey. You know what I'm saying? I don't know about you, but every time I get a shot, not that you care, but this is just me, right? Every time I get a shot, because some of them hurt. Some, you don't know. Sometimes, you know what I mean? Sometimes it can hurt. I always like stick my fingernail into my thumb like this. Why? To distract me from that. And they're trying to talk to me like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you really care? Nobody, like, Who cares? You're such a baby. Oh, I'm sorry. What's the best way to get a person to abide in this kind of evil? Convince them it's light. How do these people get duped? Have the deliverer of said counterfeit light be disguised as an angel of light. At face value, you might say, that's not light. But if it's disguised, if it's coming at the hand of someone who's, you know, seductive, they got a better chance of getting said counterfeit light into your soul. That should sound familiar. Go to 2 Corinthians 11.13. 2 Corinthians 11.13. Second Corinthians eleven thirteen. I mean, all of this should sound familiar. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. That's how they get false doctrines into the church. They just disguise themselves as apostles. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise 
to that. But no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Okay, so just think about this, right? Do you remember how the wicked queen got Snow White to ingest the poison? The answer, she wrapped it in something that looked good and appealed to Snow White's natural senses. Right? Do you remember how the devil got Eve to eat the forbidden fruit in the garden? The answer is he convinced Eve that the fruit was good for her by appealing to her natural senses. Do you remember the last time you were duped or seduced, what have you? More specifically, do you remember why you sinned? Hint. Something or someone, typically, appealed to your natural senses. Uh, do you see a pattern? Go to James 1.12. James 1, verse 12. So we have a pattern going here. How do people get duped? Well, people, agencies of Satan himself, disguise themselves as messengers, as angels of light. James 1.12. That's all angel means. I think most of you know that. This means a messenger. James 1.12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And that's why you can never blame somebody else. Oh, it's so-and-so far. They fell away from the faith because so-and-so. They got a boyfriend. They got a girlfriend. Now, listen. They, they did it themselves. What does it say? It says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by what? His own desire. So stop blaming other people. Okay, let's be real. Verse 15. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Don't let that counterfeit light into your soul. Don't think that, the, that this thing or this person that's seducing you is somehow from God. Because they are not. Anything that takes you away from the goodness, the plan of God, if you want to look at it that way, is not from God. Look, all we have to do is read verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change, because that's where Satan and the kingdom of darkness function. That's what a counterfeit is. It looks a lot like the same, but in the shadow, there's a little bit something missing. And that's all the poison it needs to get into you. Spend this $100 bill in your spiritual life. I know, it's got 10% of it's polluted, but look at that 90. Oh, what do you mean? Oh, no, it's totally from God. Look at all the good you can do with it. There is no variation or, sh uh, or sh shadow due to change. Not with something from God. Look at verse 18. Of his own will... He brought us forth by the word of truth that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So, what does Snow White, Eve, and you, when you sin, all have in common? You were duped by an angel of light. Sometimes that's inside, sometimes that's your own flesh, obviously, but you get the point. You were duped by an angel of light. In that moment, you thought that was the best thing.
Stated more practically, you were tempted by something appealing to your flesh. And as the Bible teaches us, nothing good ever comes from satisfying the appetites of our fleshes. Go to Philippians 3.15. Philippians 3, verse 15. Nothing good ever comes from that. Philippians 3.15. Hope you're all doing well out there. Again, a little bit longer than normal, but we've got to get through this. This is one complete thought. That's why. Philippians 3.15. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keeping your eyes on those who walk according to the example of you have in us, Philippians 3.18, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Look at verse 19. Their end is destruction. We just read that earlier as well. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, also translated in the New American Standard, their appetite. Their God is their appetite. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. What deceived Snow White, Eve, and you last time? Your mind was set on earthly things. Your appetite was laid bare for earthly things things, things not from above, things not good for you, unrighteous things. Typically, I don't know about you, typically, if it's not something, some kind of a pattern I have in myself, typically there's other people involved that are helping Satan in that moment. And it can be the very best of other people, so this isn't disparaging against, you know, friendships within the family. I mean, even Christ called Peter Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Your mind is not, your mind is on earthly things right now. You think you're doing something good, but your mind is not in the right place. And this is why you are held responsible. Because you might have somebody that's really trying to do good by you. Think of, you know, Job's friends, but whatever. Someone that might say that I'm trying to do good by you, but they're actually in that moment disoriented to God's will. And so you have to decide. You have to decide in that moment, is this from God? Is what I'm about to do going to bring glory to God? Is this my appetite acting up? Am I hungry? Like, do I have some kind of lust pattern in my soul or my my being, if you would, that is acting up, that I'm that wants to be satisfied in this moment? And if if I give in to that thing, is it going to bring glory to God? So I need you to concentrate again. One big thought here this morning. What's the, of all the, what's the biggest appetite of the human flesh? You don't have to answer it. Some of you have your own really, pronounced areas of your life where you sin regularly and struggle with it. That's not what I'm getting at. There's a, do, there's a deeper, a more fundamental appetite of the human flesh. What's the biggest appetite of the human flesh? What's the root cause of all sins of the flesh? What's that Hebrew word that the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to write in Genesis 3? when he captured the curse after the fall in the garden? The answer to all three of these questions is the same. Some of you already know the answer. It's Teshuka. The fundamental driving desire of the human flesh can be captured quite simply up here on the board. There's that word, Teshuka. The human flesh desires nothing more than to be superior even to God. And you say, oh, no. 
Why does it say? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's the counter to Teshuka. Because Teshuka is completely 100% opposed to, disrespectful to the Lord. And it leads to death. Teshuka is front and center whenever you sin. It's the very nature of your flesh. It says, you're not going to tell me what to do. Certainly not you, bald man. Don't preach to me. You're not going to tell me. That's your flesh. I'm not going to let anybody or anyone tell me, even if it's God. This is the root cause of all sin. Now, so I challenge you, all of you, to go home today. Make it a game if you want. I do. I'm a little nerdy. But make it a game with yourself or even other believers and pick a sin, literally. Pick a sin. Pick any sin. Like, make a hat. Oh, look at that. Right? And see how you are able to tie it back to this singular root sin every time. Every single time. The more you go through this exercise, the easier it becomes. Trust me, I live it. It's part of my job as a shepherd to see the forest through the trees, to see the simplicity of life itself and how the human flesh pollutes it. And it always comes back to this one thing. It's always Teshuka. So getting back to our message here, I'll ask the question again. What's the easiest aspect of human nature to tempt? The answer? It's desire to dominate others. To be superior somehow. To be in control. Even when it comes to God. That is the base desire. That is Teshuka. Dominate others, be superior somehow to be in control even when it comes to God. So, what do you think? You're still thinking a little bit like Satan here. Satan knows this about humans. What do you think Satan and the kingdom of darkness do whenever they want to pervert something as sacred as the gospel of Jesus Christ? You got it. They simply put out a false gospel that appeals to the human flesh's desire to be in control. In other words, to be superior. Duh. That's all you have to do. Put man in the driver's seat. And then he feels a sense of what? Control. If you want to trip anybody up, with any doctrine in the Bible, hand it over to man. Hence our previous principle up here on the board. Again, perspective. Any assertion, any assertion that God's will is submissive to man's is evil. To function in evil is to abide in the sphere of unrighteousness. In other words, to be a slave of unrighteousness, a la Romans 6. This places a person in bondage. Now, this is the kickback. Satan doesn't tell you about this part. (laughs) This puts you in bondage to their so-called free will, a will that supposes such a thing, that it's actually in control, especially when it comes to salvation. So let's go all the way back to our primary study now. Applying this principle to the order of salvation... Listen, if you were Satan and you wanted to pervert the gospel that Jesus Christ was teaching Nicodemus, let's say, when he stated that unless a person be born again, they cannot see or enter the kingdom of God, if you were Satan, what would you do? Easy. You'd appeal to the base desire of every human being to be in control. You would appeal to every human being's base desire to be in control. 
So you would say that regeneration or being born again is something you control. Is a direct result of something you chose, not God. That's what you'd do. And the human flesh would go, I like that. I like that a lot more than this whole idea of fearing God and having ultimate unbridled respect for God's decree. I like that version better. That, could, that kind of puts God on his heels. That puts me back in the driver's seat. I kind of like that gospel. Too bad it's the false gospel from the pit of hell. That's the problem with it. It's not scriptural. This is what the Holy Spirit just pointed out. As a side note, Jesus encouraged his disciples to think this way up here on the board, Matthew 10, 16. Because you are thinking a little bit like Satan right now. You're trying to say, oh, what would I do if I was Satan? It gives you the creepies, right? Some of you are like, not really. Right? Should give you the creepies. But it's a necessary evil. It's in the colloquial sense, right? It's necessary to do this thing. Jesus said, he said, Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Some of you, as soon as you cross that threshold, you can say that. And I'm back to the wolves. And do everything they can to trip me up. I've got to make sure that some disguised angel of light doesn't stick a syringe in me, doesn't bat their eyelashes, doesn't seduce me, doesn't do... You choose. Be wise as serpents. Know your enemy. Some of you are like, oh, that's Sun Tzu. Great, good for you. Know your enemy, right? Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. You don't need to jump into the fray. I've heard people do that too and discuss me, but I'll go on a rant if I go there. You, you don't save people by becoming like them, right? I'm going to leave that where it is. Because some people justify ungodliness in the most crazy ways. Be wise as serpents, innocent as doves. So again, I ask, if you were Satan being wise as serpents in this moment, what would you do disguised as an angel of light? I'll tell you what you'd do. You'd appeal to man's base desire to be in control, even over the sacred gospel of God. That's exactly what you would do. And as a friendly reminder up here on the board, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Of God means this is his salvific plan, not man's. So, if you're going to lie to someone to appeal to their human flesh regarding the gospel, what's the most efficient, surefire way of getting them to eat the poison apple? To ingest the forbidden fruit? Well, the answer traces all the way back to the fall in the garden. The answer is right under your noses. The answer is to lie to them about your ability to be what Satan has always desired to be, quote, like the Most High. Go to Isaiah 14, 13. Isaiah 14, 13. You want to trip someone up? Put them in the driver's seat. Lie to them by appealing to their flesh. You lie to them. Isaiah 14, 13. And who's the father of lies? The God of this world, no other than Satan. And look, what, look at where his heart is at. Isaiah 14, 13. You said in your heart, and this is Satan in the crosshairs, I will ascend to heaven. This is Satan. The anointed cherub defected, said, I'm not satisfied in my position here, God. I am going to usurp you. I don't have respect for you. Therefore, I don't have real wisdom. And when these little 
cockroaches you call humans come along, I'm going to, oh man, I'm going to have my way with them. I'm going to get them thinking the same way. I'm going to entice them with all kinds of false gospels and false doctrines, and it's all going to come back to this one thing. Because that's where my heart is at. I have the heart of a murderer. I'm a liar from the beginning. I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will, set, I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Oh, man. Oh, man. Are you kidding me? That's Satan's heart. The answer to the question on the table is found in the account of the fall itself. Go to Genesis 3, 1. Genesis 3, verse 1. Coming to a close here, I promise. There's one amazing consolidated thought. Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God act? Now, this is Satan, obviously. Did God actually say? Okay, wait a minute. You got the $100 bill. Let's go into the shadowy areas. Right? Let's go, let's go try to, like, twist the word a little bit. Let's create a little gray. Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. So he basically lies. And then he says, This is why God's hiding something from you. You really do have the power. You can have power over God. Connect that back to salvation. This so-called free will. You can have power over God if you accept this lie in your head. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. God. Right? Oh. oh, man. That just appeals to every bit of you and I's flesh. I can be like God. Knowing good and evil. Isaiah 14, 14, you will be like the Most High, in other words. Think of the heart of the deceiver in this moment. We already know what it, where his heart was. His heart was filthy. He had no respect for the Lord. He said, I will be like the Most High. Matter of fact, Eve, if you eat this thing, God's lying to you. I'm not, because I'm an angel of light. I bring the truth. You, too, can be like God. Hmm. So, verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, now, here's the appeal to the flesh and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her stupid husband who was with her, and he ate. I'm just kidding. I added that. Sorry, Lord. So there you have the pattern we noted earlier. The serpent appealed to the woman's base desire, to her natural senses. It's the same root cause for all sin until this day. Verse 7, the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So now they start trying to fix their own problems. And so goes the story and the ensuing curse. And I'll close this way with a shepherd's perspective. This is me telling you what the Spirit has been working out through me to your benefit. This is what I see when I look at all of you, when I look at how you're growing in the faith. So this is a shepherd's perspective. 
this incredible work God the Holy Spirit's been having me do in this series is more about removing false doctrines from your souls than inserting new ones. I really need you to dwell on what I just said. I mean, really dwell on it. I mean, don't, most of you probably have tomorrow off, so you have an extra day even. I'll say it again. My labor has been more about removing false doctrines from your souls than inserting new ones or replacing the old with the new. In many ways, this teaching will leave you with a gaping hole in your system of thinking. And the only thing that is able to fill it righteously is faith. It's faith. That's what he's been doing. He's saying, that shouldn't be there. So we're just going to remove that. But, 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 but. I know your flesh is white knuckling it. I get it. But we need to remove it. And I'm going to replace that with something that brings glory to me. A little thing called faith. Hmm. Again. In many ways, this teaching will leave you with a gaping hole in your system of thinking, and the only thing that is able to fill it righteously is faith. The whopper. There is such a thing. The most intricate surgical procedure to date in this series has been on the topic of, quote, free will. The crux being that without a proper biblical understanding of how very subservient the human will is to God and even its own nature. Well, it's open season for Satan in the kingdom of darkness. So what I've been commissioned to remove from your souls, if it was ever there in the first place, some of you didn't even have this problem, but some did. What I've been commissioned to remove from your souls is the false doctrine, albeit fundamentally appealing to the human flesh, that man somehow dictates this order of salvation we've been studying. You are either elect and predestined for salvation or you are not. I did not say that. That is biblical. So the surgery I've been performing is to remove any false presupposition that your ill-conceived so-called free will was in the driver's seat when God set forth his decree for humanity. That's what he's been calling me to remove from your soul. You were not in the driver's seat, my friend. Not in any way, shape, or form. You were not in the driver's seat. So, bah, bah, bah. You were not in the driver's seat. Bah, bah, bah. You were not in the driver's seat. Have a little faith, will you? Every decision God has ever made has been perfectly righteous. Amen? He doesn't need your help. And if he said, I predestined and I elected some over others while I let others go to their final end, the lake of fire, who the hell are we? Who are you, old man, to question me? I'm the sovereign God. You dug up the whole earth and you didn't find one ounce of wisdom. What makes you think you can talk down to me? Gird your loins. That's what he's been saying. Or, or, you ready? You ready? I'll just take this away. And you can have some faith to fill in the gap. Quit your yapping. Quit your crying. Quit your complaining. Quit your lust for more knowledge that leads to death. And quit going on the internet. Because that's what some people do. Well, the pastor took it away. I gotta go on the internet to put it back. To find a substitute, because I don't like there being a gaping hole in my system of thinking anymore. I liked being in the driver's seat. I liked being in control over God's decree. 
I like telling God, this is how you're going to decree salvation for all of eternity. You're going to put me right there. I'm going to take that pen, I'm going to be the hand, and I'm going to write in the book of life. How about that, God? How about that? That's the watered-down gospel. And what he's been saying is, I lost my thing, I got all excited. He said, I need you to take that, that presupposition out of their souls. That's the work he's been doing. And he said, and if I ever said, well, what do you want to put in there? He says, nothing. I'll put faith in there. Nothing. That's not your job. So, the surgery I've been performing is to remove any false presupposition that your ill-conceived so-called free will was in the driver's seat when God set forth his decree for humanity and in particular regarding salvation proper. In other words, you need to be rid of the bondage-inducing false doctrine that you are in any way in control. I'll say it again. You need to be rid of any of this bondage-inducing false doctrine that you are in any way in control. I'll leave you with this up here on the board. Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Amen? All right, let's get some music, get some uh, elements out here. I'll keep communion service short. Thank you for hanging in there. It's for your own good. But now you can see this is one complete thought. And maybe you have the ability to understand a little bit more of why I've been standing here for months and months teaching what I've been teaching. It's to get you closer to the truth. Come on, guys. Yep. I'm just keep going. I'm all worked up. This is, honestly, guys, this is the most important thing you could possibly ever learn. We're learning about the gospel. We're learning about salvation proper. What else is there? The entire Bible is meant to amplify it. Chris is like, should I walk him off of the music? He's like, hmm? Hmm? <laughs> I don't know what to do. This is unprecedented. Look, he's like this. He's like, I don't know. He's got a big cane. He's like, somebody get a cane. Uh, I got something up. I'm going to say thanks. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, in remembrance of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's eat the bread. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, in remembrance of his work. Let's drink the cup. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here this morning. Thank you for giving us truth. Thank you for always regarding our 
salvation, our deliverance, our freedom, even though we struggle to just respect you, Lord. Father, thank you for your patience with us, your loving kindness that is renewed each and every morning. We just ask your blessings as we take the things we've learned back to the privacy of our own souls, to our families, and you will be done out to a world that needs it so desperately. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen.